introduce himself. Great, thank you. There's a little bit of lag here. Then you get to press the slide. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so as Jan mentioned, um, I just moved here. Uh, so I started a couple months ago and uh, I moved from Cornell University. So most recently I was a professor of computer science there and also an, an associate dean at the uh, Cornell Tech campus. So I'm pretty excited to be here. Um, part of this presentation is about my own research background and some example projects, just to give you a sense of what my lab does. And then the other part is about this AI center that we're about to launch um, called the AI, uh, the Pioneer Center for Artificial Intelligence. So uh, my research area, uh, primary one is computer vision, but uh, that has kind of been consumed entirely by machine learning. So I guess I can say I'm a computer vision and machine learning person, uh, also working with human in the loop, um, fine grained augmented reality uh, type projects. So the two projects that I picked just to give some sense of, of what I work on, one is in the fine grained world uh, with applications in biodiversity and fashion and interior design and, and so forth. Uh, the other is more about computer vision and augmented reality. And it's called stay positive. So starting with Visipedia, uh, this is, uh, I'm showcasing the biodiversity component of this. This has to do with fine-grained categorization of plant, animal, and fungi species. So there's a large part of this that has to do with data set collection and curation uh, with experts in this domain. And it turns out uh, that the world's largest repository of this information is in Denmark. There's an organization called uh, GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, and arguably that's what brought me to Denmark because while working on this problem of, of uh, training models for um, species recognition, we needed a curated repository um, that would allow us to harvest that data. And GBIF, um, which is located on the KU campus, um, was a perfect place for that. So the visually speaking, there are some very small distinctions that you need to detect in order to separate different species of beetles um, or sea creatures. Um, there are challenges involving things like uh, long tail. So things like a few shot or zero shot recognition become important when there aren't that many samples you can uh, pick up, um, as well as problems like uh, domain transfer, because um, Let's say that you've trained models for recognizing thousands of species of birds, and now you want to do the same for Lepidoptera, moths and butterflies. It should be the case that these pre-trained models would give you a big head start. How do you do that at scale? Um, how, how do you keep from starting from scratch every time you want to recognize new uh, taxonomic groups? So a big part of this uh, and, and a role that GBIF plays is um, provenance tracking and uh, attribution so that when even an individual citizen scientist contributes an observation and it gets vetted by someone with more expertise, that enters a local uh, portal. It could be iNaturalist in California, it could be Art Portalen in Sweden, uh, and those get aggregated by GBIF. And GBIF keeps track of DOIs, um, citation <coughs> records, and so forth. So we're working to, uh, together with Google Research in Zurich to have data sets that can be cited and um, have proper versioning. If people want to remove their records, they can do that. So we're trying to approach this in a responsible way. Uh, Visipedia has released two apps that showcase what's possible with this fine-grained recognition system. Uh, one of them is called Merlin Bird ID. Uh, these are both free. There's Merlin and there's iNaturalist. Uh, Merlin actually just came out with um, bird vocalization recognition as well. Uh, the vocalizations are represented by spectrograms. Um, so as strange as it might sound, we actually convert the audio into images, basically because that's what our deep learning sledgehammer is capable of handling. So we turn the audio into spectrograms 
um, and then train networks to recognize them. So um, Merlin now does both uh, visual and audio recognition of bird species. Um, iNaturalist, which I mentioned before, uh, this is for tens of thousands of species of, of plants, animals, and fungi. Um, and there are other efforts that are taking shape uh, within, uh, for example, in Denmark, there's, uh, we worked with the Svampe Atlas team uh, for um, mushroom recognition. Um, some of our work in this area involves combining um, visual and textual representations. So we collected a data set that had similar but not identical species. So one of the things you learn when working with experts in these areas, um, the, the experts might hear about AI and it sounds exciting, but then they try out some of these web-based demos and they realize it doesn't solve the problems they want. Um, so they don't need a system to tell them the difference between an ostrich and a robin. That's very obvious to them. They're interested in the ones that, a, that an amateur might confuse. So we created this data set that has commonly confused species and has textual descriptions of them um, and works together with the images and those texts in a transformer architecture to create explainable representations. So you can say, these are actually not the same species <laughs> because there is a marking around the eye that distinguishes them. Um, and we, as part of this Visipedia effort, we've run this um, FGVC, fine grain visual categorization workshop for about 10 years now. And that's a place where all these different communities, not just biodiversity, but as I mentioned, fashion, uh, food, uh, cooked meals, as well as raw ingredients. These are all fine grained recognition challenges. And we serve as a matchmaker between those communities of expertise and machine learning researchers that want to try their hand at some challenging problems. So you can learn more about that at uh, visipedia.org. Um, the other project that I uh, wanted to spotlight is called Stay Positive. And this is in uh, the context of AR, VR. So specifically, it has to do with optical see-through augmented reality. So raise your hand if you've tried a HoloLens or Magic Leap headset. Okay, that's actually quite a few. Um, so uh, there is, I'll just say I'm very excited about AR, uh, but I've been excited and then disappointed many times over the last couple decades. It's always somehow five years away, um, but I do think it's gonna get there at some point. One of the things that's kind of a bummer about optical see-through AR when you try it is it's, it's something, I don't know why more people don't talk about it, but you put them on and it's immediately like sunglasses. So it basically dims the whole room. So why does it do that? Well, it needs to have some dynamic range to play with because it can only add light. You can't have an optical see-through system that's subtracting light from the scene in front of you. So you get these kind of awkward ghosting effects. And from a design standpoint, whoever's creating these GUIs and, and the presentation, the graphics is just struggling against the scene that's around them. And I'm not a designer, but it just seems like a frustrating problem compared to the VR researchers who get to render anything they want. So if you're doing video see-through AR or VR, the, you know, it's all of your canvas. You can alter any pixel you want, but in optical see-through, you got to deal with this bleed-through problem. So some of the inspiration also has a connection to Denmark. So Janus and Morton, who are both here, uh, they came over to Cornell Tech uh, a couple of years ago and did this pilot project where they had a, a ProCam system, projectors and, um, and cameras, to create these, uh, to project infinitesimal patterns on static objects um, to create a perception of motion. So this, this owl's not moving, it's not breathing. Um, but the idea is with these very subtle patterns, you can project something. Um, think of like little Gabor functions or, or small um, semi-local operators. Um, that can give you the impression of uh, infinitesimal motion. It could be translation, a, a slight 
expansion. It could be the appearance of breathing. Um, you can't turn the owl into a bicycle, so there's going to be some limits to what's possible. But this was the idea that let's try to investigate a method. Um, we named it stay positive because we want to be optimistic about it. Instead of being depressed that you can't subtract light, just ask what can you do within those bounds. So um, uh, so basically the idea is take off the shelf approaches for image generation or uh, image, uh, say style transfer, attribute transfer and so forth. Um, take those methods off the shelf, try to apply them to imagery that you see and then see how you can modify the algorithm to get rid of these ghosting or clipping artifacts. So we're not going to reinvent style transfer approaches. We wanna see how we can um, alter them. So this would be an example where we wanna take an impressionist painting and create something that looks photorealistic. Uh, if you wanted to apply an off the shelf style transfer method, it's almost certainly going to propose a residual pattern that you would have to add to this thing that has negative numbers in it. And you can't do that. And then we also don't want that sunglasses effect where you just make everything so dim that you're essentially erasing the world and just adding your own images on top of it. That's kind of a cop out. So the thing that is at our disposal is this well-known fact that we don't see what we think we're seeing. So the human visual system does some strange things when it comes to lightness processing. I think everybody's seen this, but just remind yourself how incredible it is that square A and B are actually showing the same gray level. Okay, if you haven't seen this, then you probably think I'm lying, but uh, you can look this up. It's an Adelson illusion. And um, so our eyes are playing tricks on us all the time. And if that's true, that means that we can exploit that in the, in the AR context. So let's see if there's some way that we could render a residual pattern that could be added to the image through this um, optical combiner and produce something that looks um, pretty good. Uh, that if it were placed side by side with the ideal style synthesized image, you'd probably notice some difference, some uh, brightness and contrast, off, contrast offset. But if they're not right next to each other, then you could see some fairly good results. So um, this ended up, I'm not gonna go through the method, but it's essentially an optimization over just a couple parameters for an off for a brightness and contrast offset. But uh, the heuristic baseline would just be some kind of clipping. Um, and, and so we tried a, a bunch of different methods. The, the thing is, if, if you try it, um, a heuristic method that just has clipping and you come up with this, the residual image needed to do the style transfer and you zoom in, you're going to see these uh, either ghosting or clipping artifacts. Um, the stay positive method does this um, strategic offset so you don't see that kind of problem. Um, so you can do things like change uh, a night image into day. Um, so here, this first column shows the input. This is the desired output. Um, oh, I'm sorry, the, the target is the desired output. And then you can see um, if you, uh, so the output of stay positive, there's a little bit of evidence here that it couldn't quite match the target. So if you look around where I'm mousing here, there are these lights that couldn't be removed. Um, so that kind of uh, impulsive light is just too difficult. The only way to get rid of that would be, as I said, to just diminish, uh, attenuate the brightness of the entire image. Um, and then the, the more challenging one is actually turning day into night. So how do you turn day into night if you can't subtract light? So here again, the target is over here. Um, again, because I put these side by side, it's somewhat evident that there is a washed out effect. But if you saw this just by itself, um, this is actually a pretty reasonable, this kind of looks nighttime like. Okay. And then for more localized changes, like if you want to change an attribute, so you want to take an image like this with a neutral expression and make it look like the person is smiling. Um, or 
take a, a, a dog and, and turn it into a cat. So these um, all represent the, uh, the residual patterns. So if I take um, something like a, a simple heuristic baseline that has uh, clipping included, you're going to see this artifact. So you try to create the smile um, attribute out of a neutral expression and there's this line across the teeth. And then turning the uh, dog into the cat, there's also some kind of saturation effects. Um, the stay positive method, again, it applied that strategic offset and you get less of those artifacts. Um, you can still see that there's some evidence of the line of the mouth that was present because you can't erase it completely. So uh, th these, this is the second of the two projects. Um, what I'm getting at here is that um, there, there's an element of provocation here that computer vision and augmented reality researchers could work with interaction designers who maybe have been avoiding working with optical see through AR because it's just too hard to deal with, um, with the ghosting and those kinds of artifacts. So if instead we go to them with the projector camera system or the optical see through system and say, actually, it's possible that you could develop a new design language and there's a whole lot of new constraints to deal with. You can't do any style transfer you want, but you could do these subtle changes. Like for example, if you were sitting in a car um, and you had a little pro cam system in the dome light, um, if you're just learning, uh, if you just got that car and you wanna learn the different controls, this kind of interface would be able to make uh, one of the knobs or sliders <coughs> pulsate in a way that kind of looks like it's really pulsating, as opposed to this sort of video game-like way of putting bright colored graphics on top of things. So again, that moves outside of my expertise, but within this AI center, which is what I'm talking about next, that's the kind of connections that I want to make, is to say that AI research can produce these tools that if they're put into the hands of domain experts in biodiversity or in interaction design, uh, human factors and so forth, you can get something, uh, something out of the box, new and different. So uh, now let's move on to the, the Pioneer Center um, overview. So uh, the AI Pioneer Center involves five universities. So three in the capital region and two in Jutland. And it is funded by uh, five foundations. So they're listed over there. And this, uh, it's a significant amount of funding. So it's about 350 million uh, Danish kroner and it's over 10 years. And the goal, oh, this, this is a shot of the future headquarters. Um, so they're currently <laughs> under uh, re extensive renovation. So we're sitting in temporary space right now, but there's going to be a, a headquarters at the old observatory um, in the city center in Copenhagen. Um, so the Pioneer Center, the Pioneer Centers in general, uh, of which the AI Center is one. Um, there, there should be other ones in climate and energy and, and perhaps some other ones coming out. They're all aiming for transformative impact, capacity building within Denmark, uh, positive societal impact, uh, but at the heart of it is fundamental research. So it's not applied, it's not industry focused, it's basic fundamental research. So um, a lot of faculty here are lacking that type of funding that allows them to do those long walk in the woods type research or semi crackpot crazy type of research. Yeah, I didn't write that in the proposal, but uh, <laughs> that is the kind of thing that is possible within the, the Pioneer Center. And we think this could be a very effective tool for amplifying collaborations that are already present across Denmark, but also as a recruiting tool. Uh, kind of lighthouse to, to attract talent to Denmark. It's been a long process. It's not done yet. The contract is still being negotiated, but I've already moved my family, so somehow it's got to work. Um, <laughs> and it's set to launch um, in a few months, uh, but there's a lot of pieces that are already in place. Uh, we'll be posting the uh, advertisements for um, PhD applications, postdocs, junior faculty, all those things are going to be 
uh, posted soon. Organizationally, uh, the Pioneer Center is broken into seven collaboratories or units, and these uh, they're described here. And they probably look more or less like the sub areas you would find in a call for papers for a machine learning conference like uh, or computer vision. Um, so these are typical subdivisions, except I think extended reality. So that's a place where I use my bully pulpit to influence the structure of the AI center. So these other things, speech and language, that, that's where you're gonna see natural language processing or speech recognition, networks and graphs, you know, all the computational social science, uh, computational epidemic tracking. So learning and optimization, these are all things where, that are quite standard. Why did I put extended reality in? Well, part of it is I like it. Extended reality, AR and VR, um, it's not that I want to recruit students and say, uh, hey, we made an AI center, but I'm going to pull a switcheroo and actually have you work on AR. It's more that I actually believe AR and VR in five years <laughs> will be the main way through which people experience AI in practice. So there's always a push and pull in terms of the technology that we have in our pocket or in our homes or office and the kind of experiences that are become possible uh, with AI. And right now it's largely these devices that we have um, in our pockets. But I think that simulated environments are going to become increasingly important. Uh, hybrid synthetic real data sets for training algorithms for self-driving cars or for robotics that are assisting people in the home. Um, and generally, um, I think at some point, an AR headset will break through. I don't know who's going to do it, but I confidently tell my students it's going to happen. And I want you to write those papers that will be there and ready when that technology breaks through. I know right now the battery life is not long enough. The number of focal planes is insufficient. The field of view is too small, but there are companies like Facebook and Apple that are investing billions of dollars to make that work. And it turns out if you just take off the shelf algorithms for all these other six areas, you just say, oh, you want to recognize flowers in your garden? Just throw it on an AR headset, run it, and it, it should work. No, it doesn't. It doesn't work at all. And why? There's so many factors. Some of them are silly things like motion blur or field of view. Uh, but others are just hard to explain. You just need a student to try it, run it on this Android-based system or whatever, and just try it. And you realize this is really different. There's just something different when you've got a device like this and a deliberate, intentional user that's framing the object of interest. It's almost like cheating compared to what happens with uh, AR. And I think things like eye information, eye tracking, gaze tracking, those are going to become very important. Um, so that I'm just showcasing the XR part. Uh, I know everyone hears about, you know, CX is the, is the um, causality and explainability. These are already hot areas, but I want to look a little bit in the future and say, I do think AR and VR is going to intersect with uh, AI in an interesting way. The collaboratories have co-leads that are spread across the five universities, and um, they represent um, gatekeepers. So it's a big grant, and the funds will be distributed across the collaboratories and the universities. And those, uh, so I won't be making every single decision myself as the director. So this will be delegated to the different collaboratory co-leads. They get a big chunk of budget at the beginning of the fiscal year, and then they need to decide where does it go. PhD student support doesn't have to be exactly their own PhD students. There could be some new junior faculty, and they sweeten the startup package for them uh, with some extra stipend. Um, GPU cluster access or a priority queue for a big, um, essentially supercomputer resource for the center. Um, space management. We're hoping to make this AI center, the physical center, a place people really want to be, an embassy, a headquarters, um, so students could spend a semester there uh, or more. Uh, so 
we're going to set up a rotation program and that will be administered by uh, the co-leads for their respective areas. Uh, there's going to be a space for about 75 to 80 people uh, to sit there. Um, but how exactly to structure that uh, remains to be seen. Uh, PhDs here are very short compared to what I'm used to. A lot of my students at Cornell took five or six years. It's not like that here. Um, so we have to think, when would that visit happen? Um, so, uh, and then of course, the, the middle bullet is really about things that have already emerged in a very positive way within Denmark. So it's not that the AI center pops up and creates something that wasn't there. There's already really strong collaborations between the universities. But like I said, there might be a lack of this unrestricted funding to try these wild goose chase projects, or you have a seed project and you want to apply for a bigger proposal. So that's where this kind of thing can happen. A professor from Oldborg, professor from ITU can get together, um, serve on the same committee for a student um, and jumpstart a project. Um, and the third bullet is there just to remind people that this isn't a, a brain drain or a poaching operation. Uh, as we know from the coronavirus period, which seems to be going still in some sense, um, a lot of this activity is going to happen remotely. So we need periodic in-person activities like this to keep uh, some kind of sense of group um, of common goals. But I think a lot of the activity is going to be remote. And, and my ambition as a director is to fortify those connections uh, that I mentioned before and um, just not just put people together, but say, actually, there is some funding available and let's do some um, exciting projects. Um, so far, we only have a microsite up. We don't have a proper website. So by the time we launch, there's gonna be a full blown website. Um, so we're putting together this kind of taxonomy of center membership. And I would love it if everyone here wanted to be a member. Um, so it, that's just a matter of deciding that you want to be a member um, and you would be listed on this website in one of these different categories. Um, some of the memberships have more teeth than others. Um, if you are actually, if you're on a PhD that's supported by a uh, Pioneer Center, there's some responsibilities, including a visit to the center and some other things that I'll, I'll mention later. The, uh, so I already mentioned the seven collaboratories. There's uh, 10 areas of societal impact. Um, so these probably are somewhat familiar to you already uh, because AI is in the news a lot these days. So you hear, unfortunately, often you hear about the negative kinds of things that are happening in um, climate and conservation or um, equality and inclusion, consequences of uh, irresponsible or negligent work in AI. Uh, so we want to identify these challenges and cultivate groups of PhD students and postdocs that are actually making positive uh, impact in these areas. Um, again, the funding itself is meant for core AI research publications at NeurIPS and iClear and CDPR and so forth. However, we're structuring this with, um, we're putting together these boards with representatives from these different areas of social impact and part of the PhD studies involves meaningful interaction with these boards, uh, learning how to communicate your work outside of your bubble. Um, and there's something, um, I'll skip this structure slide. Um, we have something that we call the seven step plan, which sounds a little bit like management speak, but bear with me here. Um, the idea with the seven step plan is that when you identify a project, suppose you're, suppose you're a PhD student, um, which you are, most of you, uh, and you go through your thesis proposal plan with your advisor. If you are supported on Pioneer Center funds, we will ask you to instantiate this document that we call the seven step plan that is a structured way of getting you to think about the trajectory of your research. So what you work on in a particular part of your PhD is just one point in many possible trajectories with many kinds of impacts. And I'll say up front, the seven step plan is speculative. It's a speculative exercise, but it's designed to get you to talk to people um, outside your area and think about where things could go. 
So to take an example with Visipedia, about 10 or 11 years ago, we were just sitting around thinking, wouldn't it be cool to recognize birds from pictures? I mean, that was it. That was the inception. Uh, it wasn't about biodiversity. It was just, wouldn't it be cool? Um, so from that inception, um, and, and this was before deep learning. So it, it was really not even possible to do this. Um, the state of the art methods based on gradient based features, color histograms, stuff like that, they were abysmal. It was like 18% accuracy on something that like the Cub 200 data set today, the accuracy is like 94%. But that was when we put together the Cub data set. In the early explorations, like classic computer science people, we just wrote scripts and scraped data sets of, of birds from random websites. Like, you know, should we actually talk to ornithologists? No, 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 it's all there on the web. Just write a script, download it, train models. And so we created this Cub 200 Caltech UCSD birds 200 data set, which in retrospect is a bad data set. It's a bizarre collection of 200 species of birds. It's got a lot of mistakes in it, but it ended up being very popular. And our considerable efforts to create better data sets after that, they're used by so few people. They're used by the right people, so that's nice. But the computer vision community largely just continues to use Cub 200. Uh, but the early exploration, um, that was only put together at Cub 200. Then, then comes painstorming, and life gets very hard. Um, and basically what happened was we got invited to visit the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and uh, we thought they would love us, and they, <laughs> they did not. Uh, they just said, um, you know, we, we invited you here because someone recommended you, but your data set is, is garbage. Um, but it's interesting what you're trying to do. So if you work with us, um, we'll help you make a better data set, and then you can actually produce something that would be of interest to citizen scientists or um, uh, ornithologists. So then comes the deep dive. So uh, the deep dive, and this is all inseparable from the history of science that's happening with deep learning, because this started in 2010, and this deep dive happened right when the deep learning tsunami hit. So this was, these were some heady times, um, because like from week to week, we were getting data sets from them, training big, deep nets, and getting these really good results. So it was very exciting when this was happening. Um, so we just decided to work with the Cornell lab to create Merlin uh, photo ID. And the interesting thing there was that the AI research took a back seat. It, it was actually not the most interesting thing. The most interesting thing was the curation of the data set, the citizen science efforts, the human computation workflows that were needed to harvest the data, do quality control, active labeling, so that uh, computer vision parts moved into deep learning engineering, kind of off the shelf. And what was really interesting was how you interact with all the stakeholders in that process. Um, then comes branching out. So we started the FGDC workshops um, and we met the iNaturalist team at the California Academy of Sciences and started to cultivate connections in all these different taxonomic groups, not just biodiversity, but also, as I mentioned, um, in uh, museum collections, uh, modern art, um, other kinds of museum artifacts, shoes, uh, anywhere there's some passionate group that has some kind of taxonomy and they care strongly about getting the fine grain results uh, right. So when I say branching out, it's not just um, ourselves, uh, it's that we cultivated a community to do this. Um, and in the midst of this, there was a startup company that came out called Anchovy, and that ended up getting acquired by Dropbox. And that startup, um, it wasn't directly related, it ended up being for a personal photo album organization. But the team that started that company was trained very much in this um, world of Visipedia. And then comes going global. And that was when I first started visiting GBIF um, about five or six years ago. 
and then connected with the Google TensorFlow Hub team in, in Zurich. And that was where we said, let's start thinking about this moonshot, which is what if you could recognize every living organism on Earth? Okay, we're not there yet. And there's only so much you can do with visual or auditory. Uh, you certainly need uh, genetic fingerprints to recognize certain things. But we just said, here's our moonshot. Can GBIF help us get there? And I think they can. Um, so that remains to be seen. But the idea with the seven step plan is whatever you're working on, for example, you could be working on early detection of breast cancer, um, and it's a very specific algorithm. But in developing um, a seven step plan around that, you'll land somewhere in this trajectory. And then through the Pioneer Center, we can say, here are the stakeholders at the hospital that we want you to talk to, not just the physician, but also the radiologist, the ra radiology tech, um, the caregiver at home, and basically understand. Um, and I know this may not go directly into your publication, but you have a sentence or two of justification about how early detection of breast cancer has blah, 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 positive effects. Great. Now go talk to the people that are in that chain of command and understand what that would be. And then this is where it gets really speculative. If you're just in steps one through three, you kind of just have to imagine the rest of this. But I'm suggesting that that's actually a positive exercise. You may look back on it in six years and laugh because it was so silly or all of the technology changed. But this is one of the things we plan to do within the center. Um, we're in the process as we speak of cultivating a set of moonshots or grand challenges. Um, and these, um, just based on the brainstorming that the team has done so far, one of them could be fair um, AI based healthcare. So something that is not um, intentionally or unintentionally biased against certain age or ethnic groups um, or gender. Um, brain decoding technology. Again, as I was mentioning before, in the context of AR, uh, there's this chicken and egg problem with the technology, uh, with the hardware that we carry and the software that it can run. Um, brain computer interfaces are pretty exotic today, but Denmark happens to have a lot of competence in that area. So we should think about ways that uh, brain decoding technology could be used in educational settings or communicating with the disabled and so on. Um, another one involves fake news or detection and tracking um, of misinformation in social media. Now, something to keep in mind when talking about grand challenges in the context of the Pioneer Center is that Denmark is a small country. And the funding amount that I described that I regard as big for Pioneer Center is actually tiny compared to what DeepMind, Google, or Facebook spends in a single quarter. Right? That could just be the budget that they blow to tune one hyperparameter for one NeurIPS paper. Okay, I'm exaggerating a bit, but uh, we need to be clever. We have to think about things within the Scandinavian context that could be solved that are quirky, maybe a little strange, just a different approach. I'm not talking about solving protein folding or predicting genotype from phenotype. These are things that I'm pretty sure that if DeepMind just says we want to do it and it's possible to collect the data, they will do it. Or at least the press release will say they did it. So it would be very awkward, I think, if that's the type of grand challenge that we pursue. So we need to reflect on what strengths we have. And I think that I'm very new here, so I'm still very <laughs> optimistic, but there's a high degree of trust in social institutions and the government relative to the US. Uh, there's a relatively high degree of trust in institutions here. Um, and there's a relatively strong social fabric. And now how does that translate into positive AI research? I don't know yet, but the idea is that when I look at things like uh, like GBIF, um, it's a world-class repository of information that comes from all over the world. So you could say, well, if iNaturalist runs in California, 
and Merlin runs out of New York, why don't we all just use those apps for the whole world, for birds, you know, for plants? And that's just not how it works, okay? Partly it's because humans are tribal, but it's also because you're not totally sure what they're doing with the data. And what GBIF says is that aspect of the problem will never be solved. But what GBIF did was they said, let us aggregate the data in a responsible way and let a thousand flowers bloom and every country or region can have its own citizen science apps as long as all that occurrence data gets pushed to GBIF and gets aggregated on a weekly or monthly basis. So the kind of moonshot I think about is try to do something like that for misinformation. Now, in the context of, and this is a, a, this is a provocation. This is not a, a project with leg, legs yet. But imagine some kind of repository that is like GBIF and it's fine grained and it has to do with all sorts of different categories of things of interest to people. But the first thing that most people think of in this context is fact checking, falsifiability, <coughs> structured repositories of claims about climate change or political uh, politicians or whatever. And you put that into this big fact repository and that it just solves the world's problems because then you just show it to people and you say, actually, this is the truth. You were wrong about the vaccines and now we're all good, right? Okay, that, that, at least in the US, that's not how it works. I don't think it works like that anywhere. So I think within the NLP community, that work is very important. We need to do fact checking. We need to have repositories um, of structured claim representation. Uh, but the kind of moonshot I have in mind that I think is possible in this multi-university context is one that paradoxically does not involve the falsifiable content. Instead, it has to do with the stories that we tell ourselves. It has to do with narratives and building a moonshot around feature representation, representation learning for narratives. Okay, How do we go from content that's shared in social media and again, this is a strange sounding thing, throw away the claims, throw away the fact part and pull out the stories, the narratives, the, the things uh, that are not falsifiable. So examples of this, these are multimodal. These are presented in meme format or tweets and they contain text, they contain images and there's a lot of material here. Um, so let's look at the one on the left. And, and this one on the left, I think is almost a masterpiece of, of troll farm content, or I, I don't know where it came from, but I, I, it looks a little bit poorly designed, but I assure you, this is the work of a, of a professional. Okay, I support my black friends, but not BLM. I support my white friends, but not the KKK. I don't support hate groups, All right? They're three separate sentences. We got um, hand shaking, uh, black and white hands. Skin color means nothing. You're either a good person or you're not. Okay. So what, there are the sentences that are present. There's also an imagery that suggests unity uh, between races. Uh, but when I read it, and again, this isn't about what's right or wrong. This is not about fact checking. What I'm asking myself is what are the narratives that are advanced by this um, me. So to me, this equates BLM with KKK, but it doesn't say that. So if this were posted on Facebook by that one uncle, and God forbid you comment on it and say, um, are you saying that BLM is like KKK? No, I never said that. And they didn't say that. Right? But, uh, and did he say that either one is a hate group? No, right? In fact, the narrative that that person wants to advance is that they are a person of virtue. They don't see color. Race is just some, an imaginary thing. So there is their um, narrative that is behind this. And you know, no one's the villain in their own story. So whoever shared this, 
intended to telegraph something positive. So, but what I want to do is to be able to process this in the context of a large data set with maybe a hundred thousand narratives. And I know I haven't defined what a narrative is, but think of like bigger than a hashtag and smaller than a sentence. Okay, uh, very vague right now. But this is something that it, you can invoke a set of narratives and give them weights and say, um, here is something that advances certain narratives and, and is uh, suggestive of, of certain links. Um, here's another one. And here, uh, this is, uh, I think this happened after a recent soccer game. This one has to do with commentary about difference in treatment between different ethnic groups. So what if this had been a group of Muslims that were celebrating a certain religious event? Um, so this you can think of in the context of an A-B test. So there's a certain visceral response or non-response that people have upon seeing a photo like this, depending on which group it is. And there is a narrative that is advanced here in this tweet. Um, and again, a lot of these types of tweets or shared content can have claims that could be fact-checked, and that's actually not the part we're looking at. What we're looking at are the parts that have to do with establishing equivalence or analogies, um, uh, suggesting things. Now, why do we want to do that? What we want to do is develop ways of detecting and tracking sources or uh, potential sources of misinformation. So it's the idea would be if a group in Belarus or Ukraine organizes troll farms to advance in a misinformation campaign, as I understand it, they are handed talking points. So those troll farms are paid big money from shady sources to take a set of narratives. And the same kind of thing happens with certain news agencies. In the morning, they get their marching orders and there's a set of narratives. And then the troll farm is told to get to work, make the memes, create relatable content, just generate all sorts of stuff to share those narratives. And so the idea with this project would be run this through this narrative microarray, so to speak, as if you're doing a bunch of little assays on this thing, get the signature, cut the crap and figure out where it's coming from. I'm still not saying that it's about fact checking. It's just about saying something's going viral. There's a little signature to it. A lot of people are falling for it and sharing it. Where is it coming from? Okay, so not quite a moonshot yet, because for the moonshot, you need to develop an actual vaccine. Okay, but even then you can make a vaccine and some people don't want it. So this is an example of a kind of um, moonshot that I imagine the Pioneer Center could attack. And that it's not like we have to keep this secret from the big tech companies. We could shout it from the mountains and they will never work on this. If they did, they certainly wouldn't release it because it's completely contrary to their business model. So this is the kind of thing that I would like us to work on. And I'm not adversarially, I would like to work with Facebook and Twitter and Amazon and so on, and actually figure out how to do something together. But I think expecting them to lead this type of uh, initiative would be very hard. Uh, whereas in the Pioneer Center, we could work with the School of Journalism, Social Science, uh, historians, uh, they know the narratives that have endured over the centuries. And it's same shit, different DJ. Like every generation, there's new politicians, there's new populist movements, there's new forms of racism. They've all seen it, right? But it gets refreshed. And, and it's just those people working in the humanities are so frustrated because nobody's asking them. So I think there, there is a chance for us to do that. But it requires PhD students that are going to be willing to step outside that silo and, and talk to these groups. Um, so I'll just stop there. Um, that again, that was a provocation. It's not an actual um, operating project, but 
Um, I'll be looking for students to work on that. Um, there's huge amounts of things left to be determined about the structure of the center. We're building an airplane while flying it. Um, but this is the link to the microsite if you want to learn more. Uh, so that's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. These narratives that you're talking about, yeah. wouldn't they be? How would you annotate that in a sense? Like, because they're, they are probably quite subjective as some like truth, you know, like yeah. ground truth, but isn't it also playing very much on human emotion that is yeah. different per person? Like, for example, you said the big bad uncle on Facebook who might yeah. get one way on it and never intended it in the other way. So, it's a great question. So, this has to do with hedonic. Uh, versus um, objective similarity. So in the context of um, clustering or classification or all sorts of problems on the spectrum of semi-supervised learning, um, hedonic has to do with how much you like something, how much it pleases you, how much you agree with something. So there's a lot of the... Um, the recommender community that deals with hedonic preferences. And on a lot of these politically sensitive issues that the hedonic part is hard to suppress, but the similarity part isn't about whether you like something or agree with it. It only has to do with, in our context, it would be metric learning. So I think at the root of this narrative study is a very large, triplet based loss kind of deep learning thing that is just trying to figure out which statements, meme content, images, graphics are compatible. So the kind of training data you'd be collecting would be, is A more like B than C? But this is not like clicking on pictures of bananas. This is harder because it means the crowd workers or volunteers, they have to read these things, they have to think about it. We don't know how to do that yet. But you also have so, uh, like societal biases and uh, all that kind of stuff, so yeah. Yeah, I mean, this would, uh, very few of these make sense universally. Um, so I think they would have to exist within cultural context, but that's where I invoke the GBIF analogy because they actually have a very nice uh, taxonomic system and regional coordination and so on. Uh, it's not the same, but I just think that architectures exist for having culturally sensitive versions of this. But ultimately what I want is the representations to be learned so that you can actually do transfer learning, that you can discover that one strain of populism is almost entirely predictable from another one. Now what to do with it is a different story. I have a, a, a more practical question about the, the AI pandemic. You mentioned it, this this uh, three years in history. Yeah. Yeah. Have you done some 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 considerations about this um, that that we have that we, some ideas for both the, the areas and, and, and these moonshot projects as well? How much uh, is there a different way to work than what you um, uh, or, or is there some reflections upon? How is this possible within these, uh, the frames that you're oh. <laughs> No, I, I sweat about that. I, I don't know because trying to come up with moonshots for which PhD students are fit players and then also expecting the PhD students to be really excited and you know be part of the team, that's hard because maybe two and a half years are spent figuring out what the hell is going on. And then they're just starting to figure things out. And then it gets handed to a brand new PhD. I don't know. I mean, this is. Yeah, because, because you talked about this uh, walk in the woods. Is yeah. That possible within <laughs> yeah. three years. <laughs> right. No, I don't have a good answer to that. Uh, and being inspiring only goes so far. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't know.